It is a really a great pleasure to welcome Professor Amita Bhaviskar to the University of Michigan and the center. As some of you may know that uh, after Professor Bhaviskar completed her BA and MA at Delhi University, she received her PhD in developmental sociology from Cornell University. She then returned to Delhi where she is today professor uh, in the sociology unit at the Institute of Economic Growth uh, at the Delhi University. She has held visiting positions on a global scale, including Sciences Po, the University of Washington, Yale, Stanford, and Cornell. Her accolades are indeed so many that I will not list them and embarrass her, but I will name certainly uh, one of her more impressive prizes, which is in 2010, uh, Amita was awarded the Infosys Prize for Social Sciences, which many of us know has become a sort of premier award uh, uh, in the social sciences for work on India, uh, which recognized her contributions as an outstanding analyst of social and environmental movements in India. Those contributions, of course, as all of you would know, began with her first book, In the Belly of the River, River Tribal Conflicts Over Development in the Narmada Valley, which was first published in 1995 and recently had its eighth imprint, something we could only hope for. Um, her work on water is also reflected in two edited volumes, the 2003 Water Lines, the Penguin Book of River Writings, and the 2007 Waterscapes, the Cultural Politics of a Natural Resource. She is also the co-author on a slightly different subject of untouchability in rural India, which points to the fact that Amita is such a wide-ranging scholar. If I were to um, point to just some of her more recent work, her 2008 edited volume, Contested Grounds, Essays on Nature, Culture, and Power, the 2011 volume she did with Raka Ray, uh, Elite and Everyman, The Cultural Politics of the Indian Middle Classes, and her more recent 2016 volume, First Garden of the Republic, Nature on the President's Estate on the Rashtrapati Bhavan. She is not only a wide-ranging scholar, she is a very generous one. She serves currently, I believe, on some 11 editorial boards. I don't know how she gets anything else done, um, including being a founding member of Conservation and Society, and she was co-editor of Contributions to Indian Sociology from 2011 to 2000, 2007 to 2011, a board she still serves on. But really pointing to all of this um, uh, uh, contributions to the field uh, really don't capture Amita's generosity. So to get a taste of that, you'll actually have to try and find her at our reception today, immediately following the talk upstairs on the fourth floor. I hope you'll get a chance to talk to her and you'll get a sense, I suspect, of what I mean. Rarely have I met someone who's as accomplished and at the same time as unassuming as Amita Bhaviskar. Amita first came to Ann Arbor in I think it was the 2001-2002 academic year and has returned once in the interim to share her work. I couldn't be more pleased that she's with us today I look forward to hearing more about her current research on the social life of industrial foods in India. Please welcome Professor Amita Bhavis. Thank you, Farina. You always give the most generous introductions. And um, well, anyway, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to see so many uh, friendly faces, people I haven't met for a while, but uh, also people I'm meeting for the first time. So thank you for coming. I'm really grateful to the Center for South Asian Studies uh, for hosting me here for six weeks, uh, especially to Farina as well as to Janelle Fossler who made my visit so uh, comfortable as well as just so rich in terms of allowing me to do what I wanted. And I'd also like to thank the University of Michigan for its many treasures, especially the wonderful library, um, something that I've been delighting in while I've been here, but also the many stimulating conversations that I've had with a number of you here in this room. So thank you for coming. Um, my talk today is about Maggie noodles. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Maggie is a brand of instant noodles uh, introduced to India in the late 1980s by Nestle. And it's now not only a popular snack, but it's a favorite comfort food 
for an entire generation of young urban Indians. What is the secret of Maggie's success? And what does it tell us about taste and desire in a consumer society, in a consumer economy, in a deeply unequal society? At first glance, the fast rising consumption of such so-called industrial foods seems to be a familiar story about the commodification of diets by multinational corporations. However, I'm going to argue that the success of global capitalism isn't a foregone conclusion when it comes up against nationalist politics. At the same time, the popularity of processed foods is a form of consumer citizenship as poor and low caste people who are discriminated against, in part due, due to their food practices, aspire to eat fetishized commodities that allow them to belong in the modern affluent world. And for young people, uh, instant noodles speak to their, to their desire for agency and for fun, challenging power relations in the patriarchal family. So my talk today is part of a larger project on industrial foods and how they transform social relations and agrarian environments in India. And uh, this is just my first, um, the first section of that larger project. So walking along Chhatramarg, the main thoroughfare in, uh, on the Delhi University campus one late afternoon in February 2010, I noticed that the usual roadside vendors of snacks such as peanuts and chaat uh, and, and bhilpuri had new competition. On the low wall of the arts faculty compound next to a tea stall stood a hissing portable stove on which simmered a saucepan to which a slim young man added chopped cabbage and shredded carrots. In a couple of minutes, he ladled out a mush of noodles and vegetables onto paper plates for students lounging around on the lawns nearby. At 10 rupees a plate, a steady stream of customers stopped by for this hot, tasty treat. Maggie noodles had hit the streets and they have never looked back since. Today, the um, college canteens and restaurants that students frequent may still have samosa and dosa, but the popularity of these old favorites has been eclipsed by Maggie instant noodles. Entire restaurants are now, don uh, are now dedicated to variations on a Maggie theme, serving Maggie dosa, Maggie sandwiches, and Maggie milkshakes, um, heralding the efflorescence of a vibrant fusion cuisine. Talking to college students in cities as far apart as Guwahati, Chidambaram, and Allahabad, I've been struck by the number who declared that Maggi was their favorite food. Some said they couldn't go a day without eating Maggi. Maggi noodles are a key ingredient in a celebrated dish called the Siachen omelette, cooked by soldiers stationed 20,000 feet above sea level on the Siachen glacier, along India's contested border with Pakistan, often described as the world's highest and coldest battlefield. The omelette is made out of powdered eggs stuffed with cooked Maggi noodles, two of the only foodstuffs that can survive at that Arctic altitude. <laughs> in a survey of midday meals served in government-run primary schools in Delhi, children said that they didn't want to eat rajma chawal, or you know, kidney beans and rice, or chole chawal, chickpeas and rice, the nutritious foods that they were usually served. They wanted noodles. And elsewhere in India, a scenic lookout point on the road to the um, Himalayan hill resort of Missouri, known for decades as Sunset Point, has now been renamed Maggie Point, because now that's, one, that's why one goes there, to look at the sunset while eating Maggie. So over the last 20 years, unbranded noodles have become popular across the social spectrum in rural and urban India. Rickshaw pullers in a busy retail market in Delhi crowd around a chow mein cart, twirling strands of noodles slippery with oil, soy sauce, and vinegar around plastic forks, implements they'd never come across before. Migrant workers in construction sites in Bihar and in Odisha do the same. However, in urban bastis or squatter settlements and small rural towns, the demand for these generic dishes, that's chow mein, is often outstripped by Maggi, the instant noodles manufactured by Nestle. How does one explain the phenomenal fast rising popularity of Maggi? How did a dish, how did a product that was virtually unknown to most Indians a generation ago become so popular across the country 
that's it, it's India's foremost food brand, taking the nation to fifth place in the world of instant noodles consumption. How did Maggi succeed in stimulating millions of Indians appetites to such an extent that advertising experts proclaim it the third staple of Indian food after wheat and rice? My friends and colleagues, upper middle class, middle aged parents are dismissive. What's there to explain, they say. Junk food is addictive. It's refined flour, fat and sugar and it's poisoning our kids. And they add in disgusted tones, it has MSG. Some mothers said how frustrated they were because their children refused to eat the no usual North Indian lunch and dinner of dal, sabzi, roti, dahi served at home and insisted that they would only eat Maggi. Parents' antagonism and anxieties around instant noodles are not misplaced because along with sweetened beverages and chips, the consumption of instant noodles has been linked to the explosive growth of obesity, diabetes and heart disease among children and adolescents in India. This epidemic of food-related excess seems even more grotesque in a country where the incidence of hunger and malnutrition rivals that in sub-Saharan Africa. Several commentators attribute the successful spread of Maggi not only to the product, but to its producer. Writing about Papua New Guinea, where Maggi was introduced in the early 1980s, at the same time as India, anthropologists Errington, Fujikura and Gewertz note that these convenient, inexpensive and easy to like proletarian hunger killers are at the center of a global project pursued by Nestle and other giant food corporations to transform the poor into consumers, thereby realizing the potentially immense profits lurking in low-income yet aspiring markets. By making small units of consumer goods available at low prices to billions of poor people whose cumulative purchases add up to staggering sales figures, these firms strategically, uh, strategically target what, um, uh, uh, what, what business analyst Prahlad um, uh, C.K. Prahlad has called the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. And this marketing coup could, however, only be achieved in the 1990s when cheap metallized polymer films and other packaging materials became available. And for big band brand producers of what are called FMCG, or fast moving consumer goods, um, manufacturers like Nestle, Unilever, ITC, and Pepsi. These technological innovations were crucial for downsizing their product, uh, products, making them eye-catching while keeping them airtight, enabling these com companies to deliver the guarantee of superior quality that they claim. In India, where most of these companies had already created extensive sales networks in rural and urban areas for products such as tea and soap and biscuits, the spread of tiny, shiny packets of corn chips, instant coffee, chewing tobacco, and other products was especially swift. In the case of Maggi noodles in India, the big, the big breakthrough occurred in 2002, when in response to emerging competition from brands like Nissan's Top Ramen, Nestle decided to sell its instant noodles in five rupee packets of 35 grams each, and to aggressively expand their availability in small towns. So in, 19, uh, in 2014, Maggi accounted for approximately 400 million US dollars of the company's Indian revenues. And this fortune at the bottom of the pyramid is growing at 20% annually. Errington and colleagues place instant noodles in Papua New Guinea among what they describe as a range of globally flowing, industrially produced commodities that grease the skids of capitalism as it extends its market reach, easing people worldwide along a, park, a path of capitalist acquisition and consumption." Unquote. So from this perspective, Maggi is one of a long line of consumer products, most notoriously Coca-Cola, that globalize and homogenize tastes around the world while teaching new populations to desire and to seek more of the same. They represent the triumph of capitalism on the march. This analysis is persuasive, but it's also one-sided. It's true that Maggi noodles are quintessential industrial foods, mass manufactured food commodities produced using capital intensive technologies and distributed by corporate firms. And as Jack Goody pointed out, 
The origins of the global cuisine created by industrial foods lie at the intersection of Western imperialism and advances in preservation, mechanization, retailing and transport. Overseas wars and trade went together. The classic economic choice conundrum of guns or butter, that's expenditure on defense versus civilian goods, could be actually recast as guns for butter or guns for sugar or for tea. Europe and the United States developed food technologies directed towards provisioning troops, such as, such as industrial scale canning and fortification of food with synthetic nutrients. And these technologies and the subsequent redeployment of wartime industry for um, peacetime food production, such as munitions, munitions factories re-engineered to produce um, synthetic fertilizers and chemical warfare research that led to new pesticides, these played a major role in shaping food production and consumption in India and the rest of the colonized world. In the 1960s, the Green Revolution with its package, uh, with its package of hybrid seeds, irrigation, fertilizers and pesticides, industrialized agriculture and standardized wheat and rice as dietary staples across Asia. Industrial foods were built on that foundation as firms processed wheat and rice and package them into even more profitable forms that have become increasingly central, uh, an increasingly central part of diets across the Indian subcontinent, including among the poorest sections of the population. Like white bread in the United States, industrial foods are fast becoming the lowest common denominator in diets acro across classes and regions in India, edging aside culinary di diversity and replacing small localized products with uniform mass manufactured commodities. Pushed by a multinational corporation that uses its brute market muscle and imaginative advertising to seduce customers, the success of Maggi could be interpreted as a capitalist coup in which India succumbs to globalization. Such an account of global capitalism that Errington and others provide treat this, uh, the victory of global capitalism as a foregone conclusion. It suggests that transnational corporate economic power, which includes the ability to fetishize commodities by investing them with glamour, almost always triumphs over local small-scale forms of production. However, in India, this uh, analysis runs up against the fact that the country has historically had a highly fraught relationship with foreign products. In fact, Indian nationalist identity was built around a rejection of foreign goods and companies, a strand of political consciousness that continues to influence consumers today. Ideas of citizenship remain closely tied to discourses of consumerism marked by debates about exploitation and extraction, westernization, tradition and modernity, which thread through colonial as well as post-colonial nationalist cultural projects. In the early decades of the 20th century, during India's struggle with, uh, for independence from British rule, the boycott of foreign-made consumer goods was a key strategy of protest, and khadi, or hand-spun and uh, hand-woven cloth, was its special symbol. Mahatma Gandhi led the Swadeshi or indigenous movement to reject textiles from cotton grown in India, but spun and woven in Britain, and then imported back into India at high tariffs to be sold to Indian consumers. Instead of British-made cloth with unfair economic relations woven into its warp and weft, Gandhi encouraged the use of khadi, which supported a local economy of hundreds of thousands of skilled weavers. Wearing khadi became a mark of nationalist pride, as did a host of other consumer choices that regarded foreign things as alien and dangerous. After independence, the idea of indigenous production and consumption continued to be central to imagining the nation and its citizens during the 1930s, uh, 1950s all the way through the 1970s. Satish Deshpande describes how the state took the lead in promoting import substitution industrialization through Soviet-style five-year plans with investment in capital-intensive infrastructure, dams, steel plants, nuclear reactors, and dedicated industrial towns like Bilai, Bokaro, um, Raurkela, where the citizen was meant to be a producer patriot. Spending on consumer goods was strictly controlled through fiscal policies, as well as a public ethos of austerity that frowned upon conspicuous consumption. 
The style of citizenship, however, also generated barely concealed cravings for foreign goods, aptly described by Kai Fries as cargo cults, where access to imported whiskey, jeans, chocolates, and other commodities became a mark of status and sophistication among the elite. As William Mazzarella observes, it was only in the 1990s, after policies of economic liberalization opened Indian markets to foreign-made goods, that the citizen came to be defined in public discourse by the right to consume. While access to consumer goods and the freedom to choose were considered fundamental political rights in the West by the middle of the 20th century, these ideas have had a far more contentious career in post-colonial settings, where notions of sacrifice and service to the nation have complicated attitudes to spending on consumption, especially when it involves products with foreign associations. Thus, the acceptance of Maggi noodles by Indian consumers, or for that matter, those in Papua New Guinea or elsewhere, cannot be taken for granted, and nor can the larger triumph of global capitalism. Now, Nestle has tried to overcome the potential stigma attached to its foreign origins by deploying a strategy of all-out vernacularization of its noodles. Unlike Coke, McDonald's, or KFC in India, Maggie's promotional campaigns do not have a global reference, and nor do they refer to the cultural allure of America. Maggie's glamour is anchored in Indian icons and values, um, led by movie superstars Amitabh Bachchan and Madhuri Dixit. Its advertisements draw upon the familiar Indian trope of unity in diversity to portray citizenship as shared national belonging constituted through identical consumer practices. One Maggie ad, for instance, um, cuts from a fisherman in the sea off the Konkan coast in Western India to young Tibetan monks in the, no in the northern Himalayas, all enjoying this national dish. The vernacular is used literally in the advertisements, where children bound into the house shouting, Mummy, bhook lagi hai, Mummy, I'm hungry, to which the mother replies, Bas, do minute, uh, just two minutes. And this, um, just two minutes as she turns to the stove, um, placing a saucepan of water to boil, uh, this Bas, do minute is Maggie's main slogan, marrying the promise of instant gratification to mother's desires to quick, quickly satisfy the children's hunger and enduring cultural value across, across India, if not the world. Rather audaciously, Nestle also depicts its noodles now as a way of transmitting family tradition, a bond between mother and daughter. So one ad shows a girl cooking Maggie while her mother watches, bristling with disapproval. But the mother's misgivings are soon replaced by a gratified smile when she sees that her daughter has cooked Maggie exactly the way that she does. So with this emphasis on this sociality around food, the bonding of families and friends, Nestle has taken an unfamiliar food and domesticated it so thoroughly that producers and consumers have begun blurring the boundaries between the global and the local, uh, the new and the original, a set of tactics grounded in flexible ideologies of trust, comfort, and intimacy. Yet Maggie's claim to represent the nation remains tenuous and requires constant maintenance. A major identity crisis for the product occurred in May 2015 when state regulatory authorities reported that samples of the taste maker flavoring sachet uh, contained MSG and were contaminated by excessive lead, which, uh, which then um, led the, the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India to ban Maggie world nationwide. To show its commitment to consumer safety, um, Nestle withdrew Maggie from three and a half million outlets and burnt 37,000 tons of the noodles. After getting government clearance, Maggie was relaunched five year, uh, months later, but it had lost a lot of ground. It was then that the yoga guru Baba Ramdev, who started a fast food, um, sorry, who started a fast-growing packaged food, cosmetic, and medicine empire under the Patanjali Ayurved brand in 2006, launched his own natural noodles. Patanjali claims that its noodles are not only healthier and cheaper, <laughs> they're also Swadeshi or indigenous. So on the rather ironic battleground of instant noodles, Maggie's claim to national belonging now contends with Patanjali noodles' credentials of a more authentically Indian identity. 
This shows how the apparently inexorable ascendancy of a multinational food product is in fact a process marked by risks and reversals. Coming now to the issue of caste and class and the cultural meanings of noodles. The argument that Maggie has succeeded because it is a classic proletarian hunger killer um, promoted by, uh, I think the phrase is Sidney Mintz's, a uh, proletarian hunger killer, promoted by a global capitalist corporation, also fails to take into account the product's cultural meanings in a nation defined by sharp economic and social disparity, uh, disparities. Food in, in, in India is governed by a Hindu-dominated cultural matrix renowned for the formidable complexity of its dietary rules that vary across castes, regions, religions, and, and a whole lot else. Stigma and discrimination based on ideas of purity and pollution surround low caste and working class practices around cooking, eating, and sharing food. And many, if not most upper caste Hindus will not accept food from those below them in the ritual hierarchy. Um, until recently, even in the public sphere, caste discrimination was evident in the notorious two glass system where village chai shops would maintain a separate set of glasses for Dalits um, so that upper caste patrons would not inadvertently come into contact with their so-called polluting touch and bodily fluids. Forced by birth into so-called polluting occupations such as dealing with human excreta and animal carcasses, Dalit cleaners are still given stale food and leftover scraps by their employers as part of their wages. Among the ways of keeping Dalits apart and below is to look down on what they eat, especially by condemning their consumption of particular meats and animal parts. Forced by poverty to eat beef and pork meets taboo to twice-born Hindus and Muslims respectively. And here I'm glossing over a lot of regional variations in these practices in the Northeast and Kerala and so on. But forced by poverty to eat beef and pork and then reviled for doing so, many Dalits respond to their stigmatization by censoring themselves when talking about what they eat. So for instance, most of my informants from the Dhobi and Khatik, both scheduled castes um, in Gopalpur Basti in North Delhi, were wary and only mentioned meat eating after uh, some time when, when after they had warmed up to me. So when asked about their favorite foods, informants would tactfully observe, well, you know, every tongue likes a different taste, and then they would turn away from the subject. And several speakers first named only vegetarian dishes. And I discovered how selective they had been, um, they had initially been, when they spoke more freely later and described relishing fried pork and beef kebabs. And when I asked if I could taste some, they were usually taken aback and pro protested, no, no, you won't like it. This food isn't for people like you. Mm -hmm. A comment that underlined their sense of distance from my upper class and presumed upper, upper caste identity. Some Dhobi informants who considered themselves cleaner than other Dalit castes said they only ate chicken and fish, animal products acceptable to almost all communities other than the traditionally vegetarian upper caste Brahmins and Banyas. So even though in some parts of India, Dalit groups have mobilized to challenge casteism by inverting st symbols of stigma, organizing beef festivals in Jawaharlal Nehru University and the University of Hyderabad, documenting and celebrating Dalit foodways, for many Dalits living in mixed neighborhoods, being discreet about what they eat has been essential for fitting into consumers into dominant society. The route to respectability and upward mobility has meant leaving behind customary cuisines with their painful memories of poverty and humiliation. The cultural politics of food have become even more vicious since 2014 when the Bharatiya Janata Party, a Hindu supremacist political formation, came into power at the center. State authority is now being used for campaigns aimed at imposing Brahminical values such as vegetarianism. Thus, eggs have been struck off the menu of school nutrition programs in the BJP rule state of Madhya Pradesh. In North India, the main offensive of BJP affiliated groups has targeted Muslims for allegedly eating beef. Hindu nationalist vigilantes, invoking their reverence for the sacred cow, have attacked and killed Muslims in the states of Uttar Pradesh and Haryana on the pretext that they were storing or selling beef. Embedded in such durable and deeply divisive cultural politics of identity, 
the food practices of oppressed and marginalized social groups have often proven to be fatal. So in an environment where food prescriptions and pro prohibitions are internalized as well as imposed widely as well as violently, industrial foods are distinctive in that they appear neutral, floating above older classificatory schemes tethered only to modernity. In colonial times, this unsettling absence of cultural markers kept potential customers and food manufacturers, sorry, kept away. In colonial times, this unsettling absence of cultural markers kept potential cu customers away and food manufacturers had to exercise considerable in ingenuity to overcome the suspicion around industrial foods. Distributing free samples, holding product demonstrations, and advertising that their wares were untouched by human hands and therefore uncontaminated by the polluting touch of low caste or Muslim or Christian workers were strategies to win over wary consumers. After they were accepted by elites, tea and biscuits were among the first branded foods to become popular with the masses. Even today, these items are the first ones most likely to be offered and accepted when people can't place themselves, uh, place each other socially. So for instance, if you're traveling to, uh, together on a train, um, you're likely to not offer your home cooked food that you brought along with you, but biscuits and tea will be, will be bought and shared. Maggi noodles, along with other industrial foods, are thus notable in that they transcend cultural enclosures and when available in small, uh, in, um, small low cost packets, enable consumption across caste, class and regional hierarchies. This, combined with advertising that claims Maggi as the nation's favorite food, makes them symbols of consumer citizenship. The aspiration to eat and dress and use commodities on equal terms with other more privileged people. Those who eat instant noodles thus include not only the new middle class, to use Lira Fernandez's term, but working class people in rural and urban India who can now, in a modest way, enjoy some of the same pleasures as the class above them. Since economic liberalization policies opened Indian markets, lifting restrictions on the flows of capital and labor, uh, and thereby making it harder for workers to organize collectively, um, also enabling the expansion of consumption, political expression has shifted its, uh, or I should say subaltern political expression has shifted its arena. Consumer practices are increasingly the grounds on which people negotiate citizenship by claiming social membership, access to the public sphere, and their place within the nation. Avoiding foods saturated with oppressive social meanings and eating foods free from ascriptive identities appear to be forms of emancipatory cultural politics to which many Indians have now turned. Not surprisingly then, instant noodles consumers are not confined to affluent strata in metropolitan and large cities. People who live in small towns and large villages eat noodles now. Rural Indians continue to suffer from serious deprivation in terms of basic amenities. In October 2017, um, 177 million people, almost 20% of all rural households, did not have electricity con connections. 63 million villagers were without access to clean water. And yet, even as poor Indians struggle to secure access to basic food, as evident in the Right to Food campaign, they also attempt to include more branded processed foods in their diets. Although food still makes up 50 to 65 percent of the total monthly expenditure of households in rural India, the category now includes larger outlays on tea, glucose biscuits, namkeen, corn chips, bottled beverages, and noodles. For deprived social groups whose customary food is looked down upon as provincial and crude, Foods like Maggi are a form of desired modernity. Their packaging and advertising promise not only fun, hygiene, and instant gratification, but transport the consumer into a world of good-looking and well-dressed families enjoying meals in beautiful homes. If consumption means that the consumed item is incorporated into the personal and social identity of the consumer, it also enables the consumer to briefly inhabit the world conjured up by the fetishized object. This was brought home to me when I probed 18-year-old uh, Suman Kumari's preference for Maggi over the generic chow mein sold in the market near her basti. For 20 rupees, Suman can buy a heaped plate of prepared noodles to share with her two younger sisters. To eat the same amount of Maggi, 
they must spend 24 rupees on two packets of 70 grams each and more for the beans and carrots and potatoes and peas they add to the mix. If one includes the cost of fuel and effort and time, Maggie is much more expensive. When asked why she still preferred Maggie, Suman said, it's much better, it's in a packet, right? It's more hygienic. At dinner that evening, all of us sitting cross-legged on the big bed that takes up the entire space in the low ceiling room that Suman shares with her mother and sisters, I watched their rapt faces as they drank in a Hindi melodrama on television. Hand moving absently from plate to mouth, eyes fixed on the screen as they watched the saga of a virtuous woman tortured by her scheming, filthy rich in-laws, their attention did not waver when the program was interrupted by advertisements for fruit juice, skin whitening cream and noodles. For Suman and her sisters, the palatial homes, clothes and jewellery of soap opera fantasies may always be the stuff of dreams, but consuming the products advertised in between episodes was well within their grasp. In the quest for upward mobility in an unequal society then, eating Maggie becomes an act of imagining citizenship that cuts across social hierarchies, creating new identities and, and diluting stigmatized ones. For people like Suman, Maggie is a desired taste, a lifestyle aspiration, and even a measure of distinction, uh, to use it in, in Bourdieu's sense of the term. In the politics of social inclusion and exclusion, eating the same food creates a semblance of equality, a moment when one is as good as anyone else. In the Indian context of steeply graded cultural hierarchies, this, is this feeling a consolation uh, for subaltern groups? Or is the dissonance between this moment and other aspects of one's everyday life where inequality is experienced a provocation? There are no easy answers to these questions. We're all the same, we eat the same food, is not a sentiment that has had much success in Indian social life. Atta Maggi with vegetables, um, marketed with the slogan, tasty bhi or healthy bhi, for upper class consumers conscious of the low nutritive value of the product, is what um, Nestle has chosen to differentiate Maggi, um, creating this more expensive whole wheat, uh, whole wheat product. Yet for the Dalit laborer who buys a five rupee packet of Maggi for her children, the noodles may briefly offer a respite from unrelenting inequality. However fragmentary and fragile this feeling, it nonetheless challenges explanations that focus only on the crushing power of global capitalism by showing how in hierarchical societies, industrial foods can be a way to escape oppressive traditions. Now for the last part of my, uh, of my talk, which is on Maggie and the generation gap. Now yet another aspect of Maggie's popularity that's unexamined by analysts who emphasize its role as a capitalist tool to enter and dominate third world cultures is its significance in reconstituting youth identities within family structures of power and authority. The overwhelming majority of Maggie consumers in India are, ad are children, adolescents and young adults. And from the point of view of consumer goods manufacturers, capturing this demographic slice of India is crucial. As market analyst Rama Bijapurkar points out, about seven out of 10 households in India have a liberalization child who acts as a change agent in that household. Children are not just a very attractive niche market opportunity, but are also critical to the mainstream. That's to say that young people influence the entire household's consumer choices. However, while they deliver their families at the doors of capitalist firms, young consumers also find that Maggie enables them to exercise their agency in distinct ways. Almost all my informants mentioned that they cook with Maggie, adding their own ingredients to um, the basic uh, noodles and masala taste maker supplied in the package. A graduate student from Nagaland in Northeast India staying in Delhi embellishes the dish with smoked pork brought from home. College students living in cramped hostels with rudimentary kitchens, spoon cheese powder and beaten eggs into the broth. A young banker living away from home described how tired of eating takeout, he would painstakingly cut beans and carrots into tiny pieces to add to his Maggie dinner. Many people pointed out that you can do a lot with Maggie if you're creative, laughing as he swapped stories of the unlikely combinations they had invented. An adolescent recalled that at her boarding school, 
the entire dormitory of students would partake of communal feasts of midnight maggie cooked in a large plastic bucket with water boiled by using an immersion rod meant for heating water for baths. <laughs> now, in the minds of these, uh, of these narrators, these stories signify their ability to personalize Maggie with their ingenuity and skill, the very essence of cooking. Yet most of them would be hard pressed to cook the basic dishes of an Indian meal. Many of them shrugged and looked sheepish when asked if they could make rice or dal or vegetables. Some didn't have access to kitchens. Those who did said that they didn't know how. While this is typical for young men who are traditionally not expected to learn how to cook, it's increasingly true also of young women whose parents direct their daughters' energies towards <coughs> studying for professional careers. Several men and women living in shared accommodations employed cooks to prepare food at home, but still made Maggie meals for themselves. As one of them said, it's not like potato chips where you tear open the packet and eat. You can do things to Maggie, add what you like. Given that they belong to the category of ready-to-eat processed foods, this then is the paradox. The popularity of Maggie instant noodles is partly based on the fact that it encourages consumers to be cooks. Since 2008, 25 uh, years after Maggie launched in India, the write-in campaign about me and Mira Maggie, which invites stories from Maggie eaters about how they modify the dish, engages with this dimension of consumer citizenship, that is, the satisfaction of exercising one's agency. Young people do not merely choose the product, but invest some thought and labor into transforming it into a personalized creation. However limited these choices, for those making them, they signify the autonomy and independence of being able to prepare a hot meal for themselves. While other cooking is regarded as difficult, boring, and hard to learn, Maggie's easy add-ons seem fun to do. Fun is a word that came up often in people's description of Maggie. And that's another aspect of consumption that's hard to fit into a critique of capitalist consumerism without taking recourse to the dismissive notion of false consciousness. Even as their parents condemned Maggie as junk food, most of the upper middle class adolescents and young adults I interviewed shrugged off these concerns with some version of, yeah, but Maggie is fun. But when asked why, several just giggled. But Sudha said, junk food hai na, is liye. It's fun because it's junk food, suggesting that pleasure also lies in transgression, in knowingly eating something that's bad for you, to enjoy only without overthinking it. Others ascribed the pleasure of Maggie to the sensual, sentimental associations, the mouthful, uh, the, the mouthfeel of the noodles, that soft, curly form that you suck in, and the distinctive flavor of the masala taste maker that converts white flour, oil, sugar, and assorted chemical additives into a veritable sensorium. For Indian students abroad, 25 to 35 year olds, Maggie is the stuff of nostalgia and longing, a cultural memory from which they're exiled unless they carry packets of the stuff in their suitcases or pay premium price at Indian grocery stores. For them, Maggie is a beloved comfort food a taste they share with a youthful community of millions, a cultural good that consolidates and affirms their identity as young Indians. The consumption of commodities like instant noodles marks a decisive shift in the demographics of power. It creates and affirms a youth identity within households and in the public sphere, spaces hitherto dominated by older male patriarchs. If one thought that noodles couldn't possibly be consequential in such social change, one has to only recall Jitendra Chattar, the Khap Panchayat or traditional caste council leader from Jind in, North, uh, in, in Haryana, who blamed noodles for hormonal imbalances in young men that caused them to become sexually violent. The widespread derision with which this comment was greeted showed how thoroughly noodles have become incorporated into local diets. Old men may express a fear of foreign goods uh, foreign foods and frustration at rebellious youth who no longer listen to their elders. But for the younger generation, noodles are here to stay, their strands binding them together as autonomous, agentive consumer citizens. The career of instant noodles demonstrates that food is not only about securing biological nutrition, but about cultural desires shaped by the politics of capitalism, nationalism, caste, and age. Even as right-to-food activists strive to accommodate the diversity of Indian foodways 
promoting millets to end the monopoly of wheat and rice, for instance, they confront the challenge of a generational shift in what is considered good to eat as young people move away from local, more nutritious diets to branded industrial foods of low nutritional value, junk foods. For young people, their consumption defines an identity that proclaims their independence, displaying themselves as people who can cook and have fun. At the same time, for poor people stigmatized by caste, religion, and rurality, eating processed food signifies participation in a desired modern lifestyle of being as good as anyone else. So these foods play an important part in claiming social belonging and equality. While the increasing incorporation of industrial foods into Indian diets is an index of the presence and power of specific forms of capitalism, it's also been an opportunity for specific social groups to shape the substance of citizenship for themselves. This consumer citizenship, however contradictory and constrained by capitalist relations, reflects some of the changing contours of social inequality and aspirations in India, the questioning of hierarchies of caste and age, and the constitution of pleasures, large and small. And Maggie noodles are a useful device for understanding how industrial foods transform the simmering broth of social relations. That's India's contemporary cultural landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Amitha. Um, I was wondering, when did you conduct, conduct the study? The reason I ask is, isn't um, a, a, another trend that we see is the foodie culture? So with a lot of young people becoming very interested in local, organic, and, and I'm wondering how Maggie has positioned itself in that market. So you do have you know, an example of Atta Maggie and you know, slightly healthier Maggie, but hasn't this sort of more organic local food ways sort of made this story a story that's maybe a little dated? I don't know, I'm asking. Yeah, uh, as you know, as you should know, because I first, the very first, very kacha version of this paper was presented at a conference that you had organized on, uh, on the long 20th century in India. Um, so this paper has, had a, has traveled a long way. Um, but uh, the, but the, the, the group that I'm talking about that you know, has this strong relationship with Maggie is different from the foodies. Foodies look down with disdain on Maggie, even though they might actually be eating Maggie you know, every now and then because you, know, you need a quick meal in a hurry. Um, but in India, the, the, there are the kinds and kinds of foodies because there's a cosmopolitan foodie which is all about, you know, learning about different kinds of French cheeses and wines and um, you know, their aspirations for uh, a certain kind of cultural mastery is all to do with you know, foreign cuisines, especially Western foods. Um, there are other foodies who are into um, exploring the regional diversity of India, and I think those are the kind that, that you're talking about. Um, they are, uh, mind you, not always uh, coterminous with those who are into health foods because um, there'll be many people who will say, oh, you know, have you eaten Chetinad cuisine or Syrian Christian food or this, that, and the other. And um, what's interesting is that a lot of those people are also major meat aficionados. Uh, you know, that Indian regional food um, uh, appreciation is often um, very carnivorous. Uh, you know, this is just a sort of passing observation. Um, whereas the people who are uh, discovering quote unquote peasant foods, millets, um, and so on, are a very small and elite fragment. Uh, they're often people who um, are in, able to invest, uh, who are able to command the resources that will allow them to buy foods which are quite laborious uh, to prepare because they have domestic workers or because they can you know go to fab india and buy some you know semi processed version of of you know ragi um, or something else 
uh, the, the, the burgeoning organic uh, and very expensive organic fresh produce that's now available uh, either <laughs> online or in some Indian, uh, big Indian cities uh, caters to that extremely elite uh, fraction. Um, these are the people, these are the kinds of, I know a number of people like that, and they're the kind who would not allow Maggie into their house at all. Yeah. So um, that is uh, one section, and I think uh, th this, this move for elites to rediscover, you know, older forms of cuisine, especially elaborate traditional food, uh, is not confined to India, it's happened in other, other places as well. Um, there, there's a lot of fetishization that's uh, happening there. Uh, within that, there's this even smaller subsection that is concerned about uh, the larger environmental politics um, of what they consume. And those are the sorts of people who might buy a book like the two volumes of recipes of traditional foods that have been published by the Center for Science and Environment. So there are all of these little, little you know, pockets of things. But when one looks uh, at the numbers, uh, I would suspect that uh, the kind of people that, that you asked about are still perhaps only still in the you know, tens of thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands maybe. But with Maggie, we're talking about you know, tens of millions, quite possibly hundreds of millions. Right, but yeah. I guess my, my question would be that is it aspirational still? So Maggie at a certain point was aspirational, that the first it, it marked your class status, you were consuming modernity. But when that elite has turned its back against it, then is it aspirational still or is it now utilitarian? That it is much easier to, you know, cook Maggie than it is to yeah. make ragi or yeah. Yeah. For the people who would have traditionally eaten ragi as their staple, Maggie for, the, for many of them is still aspirational because um, it's, it's still not something that they can eat every day. So uh, what most of my research has been, um, you know, has been conducted with two different groups of informants. One, uh, young adults, adolescents who are, uh, you know, college going or, in, or young professionals. And these are people who are reasonably well-to-do. They've grown up with Maggie. And the other are uh, people in uh, this Basti um, in North Delhi, for whom Maggie is something that they've come to recently. And um, it's still something that they can't eat on a, you know, in, eat ev every day. So for them, Maggie isn't the kind of comfort food uh, that it has become for the other group. Yeah. So it's aspirational for one group, but not for the other. I had a quick question, Amita. You showed one slide where you showed the different flavors of Maggie, and through the years, Nestle has tried to introduce other flavors which have flopped spectacularly. So what did you learn about taste from your informants, uh, and what is it about masala Maggie which makes it so desirable while all the other flavors yeah. fail? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Maggie, I think, first entered the market with uh, at least two flavors. There was, the, uh, there was chicken and there was masala. And over the years, uh, you know, talking to shopkeepers, uh, chicken, they don't even bother to stock chicken anymore. Um, but this is in Delhi. In the Northeast, the, um, uh, the, the you know, chicken-flavored Maggie does very well. But in fact, comp has to compete quite strongly with um, the pork flavored, um, wh what's the name of this noodle? It, it's manufactured, why, 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 why? Manufactured in Nepal, which is very popular in, in the Northeast. So uh, they prefer, you know, they, they're not that um, fond of the masala taste. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know what the magic of the masala taste maker is, but it clearly is something that, um, you know, grows on people over time because for them, I, I suppose it's a bit like Coke. Nothing quite tastes like that. So there's no, you know, other things have, you can come up with other noodle, uh, you know, brands and other tastemaker flavoring packets, but um, nothing quite matches that masala. That's what, that's what people say. I, you know, I don't know why it's so, popular, but I guess some things just grow on you. <laughs> yeah. 
Thanks for a great talk. I had a couple of just quick questions about the noodles themselves and the kind of work they do. You, you mentioned chow mein, and I remember, you know, late 80s in India, all these, even in provincial places, you'd have a little Chinese restaurant heavily Indianized. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering about the, the it's, they're clearly modern in some fashion, but I'm wondering if, are they regionally or culturally marked in any way? Are they seen as coming more from Europe or the U.S. or more from China, or is it just something genuinely kind of stripped of all reference at all. I was thinking about my parents who talked about the first time they ate noodles and they thought that that was Italian thing. You went to an ethnic store to get the noodles and, and that, but now we don't so much associate. But the other thing is I was wondering about the precisely that two minute business and how, how much of, how much of, uh, sort of motherly investment and care is about how long everything takes to make. And, 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 and so that's what makes a good dinner is that you took, you got up at 6 a.m. and you started this and, the, and ground that and, done, and then it took it took 12 hours and that's why you that's why it's such a beautiful tasty food and that's why there's so much love in it how does how does how do they use maggie for that i mean saw you in your little example it's quick and satisfaction but that's not the same kind of fulfilling long-term effort that that usually associated with motherly care yeah oh that's a great question thanks well um i think i mean i'm, I'm just speculating i think the fact that Maggie is a snack means that it's you know it allows it's it's valued as part of um, it's it's as an expression of care but um, it's not a substitute for the cooking of the more standard more elaborate more effort intensive uh, intensive meals so uh, the two would go hand in hand um, but a lot of mothers said that it's the children who refuse to eat other meals so who don't you know who see the production of that sort of uh, you know the larger um, menu as just being you know something that puts them off they would rather their mother you know gave them maggie noodles to uh, to eat when they came home from school there are children who insist that uh, their school tiffin not have sandwiches or parathas uh, you know, mother, instead of a mother waking up early in the morning and making parathas, they want to take Maggie noodles. I mean, they'd rather eat congealed noodles in their lunch break in school um, than parathas. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, sorry, it's not a very good answer, but, uh, but I don't think um, if, yeah, if expressions of love are also to, to you know, that display of effort, uh, Maggie doesn't um, fit that. But I think Maggie is supposed to be an additional expression of love, not a replacement for uh, the other stuff. Um, the chow mein, chow mein is, uh, is very, uh, is still marked, you're right, as Chinese. And, uh, you know, the, the name is Chinese. Um, Maggie is not. Uh, I, I don't know how people make this, make such a clear cut separation, but uh, no one calls eating Maggie uh, you know, nobody says this is like eating chow mein. Or they don't say, you know, hum chow, hum chow mein ka, hum Chinese ka rahe hai. Whereas chow mein is, that's Chinese. Yeah. Um, and whether, the, I, I think this is something that uh, perhaps Nestle did quite deliberately because uh, they don't sell noodles, you know, in their Western market. Maggie is actually a flavoring sauce uh, and they, these are stock cubes called Maggie in the European markets. Um, it's only in South Asia that they sell Maggie as, um, as noodles. But um, I, I, I don't know, I have to think more about why they chose to do one or the other. I mean, I, I'm arguing that it's because they wanted the product to seem familiar and, you know, indigenized. But they might be, I, I should talk more and find out about this. Thanks. Yes. In the course of your talk, I began thinking about the sequence, production, consumption, and waste products. And of course, it's the waste products that takes us into environmental politics in one way or another. Next weekend in this country is our annual uh, Earth Day celebration or mobilization. 
And Greenpeace and a couple of other national organizations have been, have chosen for this year's focus topic, single-use plastics and the vast accumulation of plastic bottles, plastic uh, shopping bags, on and on and on, and the enormous waste uh, challenge that that has meant on land and uh, in the water. <laughs> and as I was <laughs> watching these slides, I began to imagine $400 million worth of Maggie packaging. Uh, wondering if the environmental movement has picked up on plastics, specifically a single, uh, s such highly visible element as that, as something to be campaigning about. I know that in some local situations around the country, uh, plastic shopping bags have actually been abolished in the market, and that's, to my mind, really rather extraordinary. But what about this one? It is surely huge. It is huge, and there's nothing being done about it. You're right, the plastic uh, bags, the carry bags uh, of a certain um, thinness have been banned, um, but that hasn't really resulted in their being abolished. I mean, there's, Delhi has a ban on thin plastic bags Everybody uses them still, you know, the panni. Um, so there needs to be far more done just on the plastic or the carrier bags issue. But you're absolutely right. There's nothing, almost nothing being done about these kinds of packaging uh, uh, methods, which um, people who uh, scavenge uh, won't collect because they can't be recycled, if, if I'm right, right? Yes. Yeah, because Dana's her PhD is on, on, the, uh, on this work of recycling. Um, and it's completely changed the landscape, not just in cities where there is attention to solid waste, but in rural India. Because instead of, you know, earlier, the, when I first started doing research in, um, you know, in 1990 in the Narmada Valley, uh, there would be, you know, the villagers would throw things away. But apart from the occasional, you know, rubber, flip-flop, you know, Hawaii chappal, there'd be nothing else that was left because everything was biodegradable. Now, the same places, I mean, you, you can't escape these tiny packets lying around everywhere and nobody is even thinking about it. So, uh, I think this is just a, sort of, it's a colossal problem and um, we need to have more campaigns to try and get these manufacturers to stop using these uh, these, these products, but uh, so much of their marketing is based on, you know, the way these products look, but also that they can guarantee a certain airtight quality. Uh, these materials can do that. So I think they'd be, they'd be loath to move away from, from th this packaging. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, that's one side of the uh, consumer revolution that's um, well in so many other ways too uh, consumerism has taken huge tolls on the environment but this in particular is is nasty and large and it's here to stay hey amita thanks for this talk i wanted to push a little bit on the framing part and the citizen consumer part mm -hmm. of the equation i guess i'm i'm wondering one i guess is if you would tell us a little bit more about the broader contours of the project itself and, and where this, you know, you said it's part of a larger work, right, and where this fits in. But I guess the other thing I'm wondering is that your reading of this, um, you know, we have an unequal landscape, right, the kind of emphases of your talk in terms of the framing that in context of an unequal landscape, it's clear that you're pushing back against a literature about like the triumph of, of, you know, Nestle, the great success story. But I'm also wondering like, what do we do with the story of this consumption as a form of, um, you know, for, for, for people on the lower end of the social scale? Um, there's, 
I'm not sure quite what to do with this as a way of equalizing or um, you know erasing their difference, uh, you know obfuscating that difference. I'm I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. Kind of I want to take that argument to the next step in the argument, and I'm not sure what that next step is for you. I guess does that make sense as a hmm. Okay, well, let me try and... Yeah, uh, sorry, it's uh, very, try and, yeah. a little inchoate. No, but um, I, I think that I'm, I'm thinking about citizenship, I mean, clearly not in terms of the formal you know, aspects of citizenship in terms of the right to vote, etc. I'm not even talking about citizenship in terms of substantive rights as, you know, a relationship between the state and... Um, and, and and subjects, uh, but citizenship in the sense of cultural belonging. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not quite sure where uh, or how much weight this particular form of consumption has um, in relation to all the other enormous kinds of inequalities and injustices that prevail in India. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't want to suggest that this is you know, this great emancipatory politics that's going to lead to, um, you know, a better world in India. All I'm trying to do is um, try and understand the popularity of these foods um, in terms, you know, in terms of people who, uh, or on the terms of the people who consume them. Um, so it's a very, it's a limited argument. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's not an argument that I see as overturning anything yeah. very much. I guess maybe a, a follow-up question would be um, how, how explicitly, thanks, how explicitly are they articulating the language of citizenship and, and belonging, right? And how much of that is the analytic um, interpretation of, of what's happening, because, right, I mean, could you? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, I, I'd, I'd have to confess that it's the analytic, um, this, this argument that this is in fact about citizenship mm -hmm. is my own, yeah. yeah. Um, no one explicitly said to me that, you know, we feel that we belong, you know, to the nation. And people did say things like, you know, these products are good because, you know, this is about living well. And um, th these are, I think, things which are hard to, uh, to catch in ways which are explicitly <laughs> articulated. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm interested in the texture of how you get, you know, what's getting you to that, to that point. And that's interesting, too. Yeah. Um, I think I have to try better to to you know, convey why I think this is, um, you know, the, these matter as forms of cultural belonging, mm -hmm. um, because you know the the literature, say coming from the marketing side, is in fact all about this is these are aspirations and these are aspirations about uh, just consumption about the good life, mm -hmm. um, but I'm actually trying to argue that in fact there's more going on both on the side of the manufacturer, the kinds of arguments that Nestle is using in order to sell their products. Uh, it's not just about the good life, it's about you know loving your children, it's about um, shared belonging in a nation that holds, that has the Himalayas and the whatever, the, you know, the Indian Ocean uh, together. Uh, it's about all of those things and you know I'm hoping to show that all of those are also, um, that there's a swirl of larger associations and sentiments around Maggie and other industrial foods of that kind that is more than about just the good, good life. So, I'm, you know, I, it, it's an argument out there, so, yeah. Thanks, Amita. This was uh, really, very engaging and rich. And I just wanted to ask you, um, so, in how do you see the story of Maggie, uh, as, and as you frame it, you know, uh, between consumption, you know, nationalist anxieties and global capitalism, as similar to and and or different from how you know the Mince, Sydney Mince's account of how sugar became aspirational for the English working classes and 
blurred certain boundaries of uh, hierarchy and taste. Uh, uh, that's one. And just second, speaking of the manifest, so um, how I mean, we keep, we read o occasionally, you know, uh, off and on about Pepsi's problems with potato farmers uh, in India. And if you could just share some things about how Nestle is managing wheat procurement, uh, which must be, I mean, are they contract farming or uh, which is probably the other side of also reconfiguring citizenship in the country? Yeah. Oh, um, that's right. That is a, a, a part of you know reconfiguring the agrarian economy and and uh, and so on. Um, as far as I know, Nestle doesn't uh, doesn't contract with farmers. <laughs> they they're buying wheat, you know, in the in the open uh, market. Yeah. Um, so they're not they're not doing that. Uh, your first question about. Um, Mintz's argument um, and about the place of sugar in uh, in the emergence of a working class in in Europe um, is, I think, I mean, it's it's a larger argument that holds for a la for a number of commodities. The argument that these are proletarian hunger killers, uh, cheap mass manufactured uh, sources of basically energy that allow workers to uh, work, but then also provide a break to the industrial working day. You know, where you have sugar with in your tea and, and you know, so the, uh, the, the convenience to, uh, you know, a consumption habit, right? Like similarly to the, to the Indian housewife or Indian working woman was making these, you know, now we will also have sugar and that tea. I mean, so that, that cultural side is also there in the Indian argument, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it is, I mean, Mintz is in fact wonderful because he manages to deal with all of it from the political economy, you know, and, and the relations of, um, social relations in, in terms of the, the cultural politics as well. Um, I, uh, I can't actually answer your question satisfactorily, I'm afraid. I need to think much more about it. Um, I, you know, part of the problem with this paper, and I'm conscious about it, is that Maggie is a narrative device. I mean, I'm using Maggie to talk about industrial foods, but at the same time, I spend a lot of time on Maggie. <laughs> so, uh, just because I think it's, you know, I, I, it's fun. <laughs> if you'd considered um, interviewing the advertising agencies that produce the campaigns, they may be able to articulate what their aspiration for it is much better than even the busty people can. Um, and their perhaps upper class, upper caste, would cross cut some of what the busty perceives. I just wondered if that was a possible research avenue. Yeah, that would be a Im very important, even essential part of trying to you know, flesh this story out. I haven't yet had access to uh, the advertising companies. That's, you know, that's a shortcoming. I've been only able to refer to, you know, to books by advertising and um, you know marketing analysts, so um, I haven't been able to talk to anybody specifically about the Maggie campaigns, how they've changed over the years. Uh, but you know, it's it's a it's a it's a crucial part of how the story is organized. So, thanks. Yeah. I'm going to say thank you, Amita, for our final lecture. Thank you. Thank you.